the son of a Baptist preacher who had emigrated from Northern Ireland, Chester A. Arthur was America's 21st president, 1881-85, succeeding President James Garfield upon his assassination. Dignified, tall, and handsome, with clean-shaven chin and side whiskers, Chester A. Arthur looked like a president. The son of a Baptist preacher who had emigrated from Northern Ireland, Arthur was born in Fairfield, Vermont, in 1829. He was graduated from Union College in 1848, taught school, was admitted to the bar, and practiced law in New York City. Early in the Civil War he served as Quartermaster General of the State of New York. President Grant in 1871 appointed him Collector of the Port of New York. Arthur effectively marshaled the Thousand Customs House employees under his supervision on behalf of Roscoe Conkling's stalwart Republican machine. Honorable in his personal life and his public career, Arthur nevertheless was a firm believer in the spoils system when it was coming under vehement attack from reformers. He insisted upon honest administration of the Customs House, but staffed it with more employees than it needed, retaining them for their merit as party workers rather than as government officials. In 1878 President Hayes, attempting to reform the Customs House, ousted Arthur. Conkling and his followers tried to win redress by fighting for the renomination of Grant at the 1880 Republican Convention. Failing, they reluctantly accepted the nomination of Arthur for the vice presidency. During his brief tenure as vice president, Arthur stood firmly beside Conkling in his patronage struggle against President Garfield. But when Arthur succeeded to the presidency, he was eager to prove himself above machine politics. Avoiding old political friends, he became a man of fashion in his garb and associates, and often was seen with the elite of Washington, New York, and Newport. To the indignation of the stalwart Republicans, the one-time collector of the Port of New York became, as president, a champion of civil service reform. Public pressure, heightened by the assassination of Garfield, forced an unwieldy Congress to heed the president. In 1883 Congress passed the Pendleton Act, which established a bipartisan civil service commission, forbade levying political assessments against office holders, and provided for a classified system that made certain government positions obtainable only through competitive written examinations. The system protected employees against removal for political reasons. Acting independently of party dogma, Arthur also tried to lower tariff rates so the government would not be embarrassed by annual surpluses of revenue. Congress raised about as many rates as it trimmed, but Arthur signed the Tariff Act of 1883. Aggrieved Westerners and Southerners looked to the Democratic Party for redress, and the tariff began to emerge as a major political issue between the two parties. The Arthur administration enacted the first general federal immigration law. Arthur approved a measure in 1882 excluding paupers, criminals, and lunatics. Congress suspended Chinese immigration for 10 years, later making the restriction permanent. Arthur demonstrated as president that he was above factions within the Republican Party, if indeed not above the party itself. Perhaps in part his reason was the well-kept secret he had known since a year after he succeeded to the presidency, that he was suffering from a fatal kidney disease. He kept himself in the running for the presidential nomination in 1884 in order not to appear that he feared defeat, but was not renominated, and died in 1886. Publisher Alexander K. McClure recalled, No man ever entered the presidency so profoundly and widely distrusted, and no one ever retired, more generally respected. Chester Allen Arthur, October 5, 1829 to November 18, 1886, was an American politician who served as the 21st President of the United States from 1881 to 1885. He was a Republican lawyer from New York who briefly served as the 20th Vice President under President James A. Garfield. Arthur assumed the presidency after Garfield's death on September 19, 1881, and served the remainder of his term until March 4, 1885. Arthur was born in Fairfield, Vermont, grew up in upstate New York and practiced law in New York City. He served as quartermaster general of the New York militia during the American Civil War. Following the war, 
he devoted more time to New York Republican politics and quickly rose in Senator Roscoe Conkling's political organization. President Ulysses S. Grant appointed him as collector of the Port of New York in 1871, and he was an important supporter of Conkling and the stalwart faction of the Republican Party. In 1878, following bitter disputes between Conkling and President Rutherford B. Hayes over control of patronage in New York, Hayes fired Arthur as part of a plan to reform the federal patronage system. In June 1880, the extended contest between Grant, identified with the stalwarts, and James G. Blaine, the candidate of the half-breed faction, led to the compromise selection of Ohio's Garfield for president. Republicans then nominated Arthur for vice president to balance the ticket geographically and to placate stalwarts disappointed by Grant's defeat. Garfield and Arthur won the 1880 presidential election and took office in March 1881. Four months into his term, Garfield was shot by an assassin, he died 11 weeks later, and Arthur assumed the presidency. As president, Arthur presided over the rebirth of the U.S. Navy, but he was criticized for failing to alleviate the federal budget surplus which had been accumulating since the end of the Civil War. Arthur vetoed the first version of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, arguing that its 20-year ban on Chinese immigrants to the United States violated the Berlin Game Treaty, but he signed a second version, which included a 10-year ban. He appointed Horace Gray and Samuel Blatchford to the Supreme Court. He also enforced the Immigration Act of 1882 to impose more restrictions on immigrants and the tariff of 1883 to attempt to reduce tariffs. Arthur signed into law the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act of 1883, which came as a surprise to reformers who held a negative reputation of Arthur as a stalwart and product of Conkling's organization. Suffering from poor health, Arthur made only a limited effort to secure the Republican Party's nomination in 1884, and he retired at the end of his term. Arthur's failing health and political temperament combined to make his administration less active than a modern presidency, yet he earned praise among contemporaries for his solid performance in office. Journalist Alexander McClure wrote, No man ever entered the presidency so profoundly and widely distrusted as Chester Allen Arthur, and no one ever retired, more generally respected, alike by political friend and foe. The New York World summed up Arthur's presidency at his death in 1886, no duty was neglected in his administration, and no adventurous project alarmed the nation. Mark Twain wrote of him, it would be hard indeed to better President Arthur's administration. Evaluations by modern historians generally rank Arthur as a mediocre or average president. Arthur has also been described as one of the least memorable presidents. Arthur arrived in Washington, D.C., on September 21. On September 22, he retook the oath of office, this time before Chief Justice Morrison R. Waite. Arthur took this step to ensure procedural compliance, there had been a lingering question about whether a state court judge, Brady, could administer a federal oath of office. He initially took up residence at the home of Senator John P. Jones, while a White House remodeling he had ordered was carried out, including addition of an elaborate 50-foot glass screen by Louis Comfort Tiffany. Arthur's sister, Mary Arthur McElroy, served as White House hostess for her widowed brother, Arthur became Washington's most eligible bachelor and his social life became the subject of rumors, though romantically, he remained singularly devoted to the memory of his late wife. His son, Chester Jr., was then a freshman at Princeton University and his daughter, Nell, stayed in New York with a governess until 1882, when she arrived, Arthur shielded her from the intrusive press as much as he could. Arthur quickly came into conflict with Garfield's cabinet, most of whom represented his opposition within the party. He asked the cabinet members to remain until December, when Congress would reconvene, but Treasury Secretary William Wyndham submitted his resignation in October to enter a Senate race in his home state of Minnesota. Arthur then selected Charles J. Folger, his friend and fellow New York stalwart as Wyndham's replacement. Attorney General Wayne McVeigh was next to resign, believing that, as a reformer, 
he had no place in an Arthur cabinet. Despite Arthur's personal appeal to remain, Mac Vig resigned in December 1881 and Arthur replaced him with Benjamin H. Brewster, a Philadelphia lawyer and machine politician reputed to have reformist leanings. Blaine, nemesis of the stalwart faction, remained Secretary of State until Congress reconvened and then departed immediately. Conkling expected Arthur to appoint him in Blaine's place, but the president chose Frederick T. Freelinghuisen of New Jersey, a stalwart recommended by ex-president Grant. Freelinghuisen advised Arthur not to fill any future vacancies with stalwarts, but when Postmaster General James resigned in January 1882, Arthur selected Timothy O. Howe, a Wisconsin stalwart. Navy Secretary William H. Hunt was next to resign, in April 1882, and Arthur attempted a more balanced approach by appointing half breed William E. Chandler to the post, on Blaine's recommendation. Finally, when Interior Secretary Samuel J. Kirkwood resigned that same month, Arthur appointed Henry M. Teller, a Colorado stalwart, to the office. Of the cabinet members Arthur had inherited from Garfield, only Secretary of War Robert Todd Lincoln remained for the entirety of Arthur's term. Arthur could not appoint a new vice president to fill the vacancy, as this was prior to the 25th Amendment to the Constitution. As the 1884 presidential election approached, James G. Blaine was considered the favorite for the Republican nomination, but Arthur, too, contemplated a run for a full term as president. In the months leading up to the 1884 Republican National Convention, however, Arthur began to realize that neither faction of the Republican Party was prepared to give him their full support, the half-breeds were again solidly behind Blaine, while stalwarts were undecided, some backed Arthur, with others considering Senator John A. Logan of Illinois. Reform-minded Republicans, friendlier to Arthur after he endorsed civil service reform, were still not certain enough of his reform credentials to back him over Senator George F. Edmonds of Vermont, who had long favored their cause. Business leaders supported him, as did Southern Republicans who owed their jobs to his control of the patronage, but by the time they began to rally around him, Arthur had decided against a serious campaign for the nomination. He kept up a token effort, believing that to drop out would cast doubt on his actions in office and raise questions about his health, but by the time the convention began in June, his defeat was assured. Blaine led on the first ballot, and by the fourth ballot he had a majority of 541 votes, while Arthur only received 207. Arthur telegraphed his congratulations to Blaine and accepted his defeat with equanimity. He played no role in the 1884 campaign, which Blaine would later blame for his loss that November to the Democratic nominee, New York Governor Grover Cleveland. Arthur left office in 1885 and returned to his New York City home. Two months before the end of his term, several New York stalwarts approached him to request that he run for United States Senate, but he declined, preferring to return to his old law practice at Arthur, Nevels and Ransom. His health limited his activity with the firm, and Arthur served only of counsel. He took on few assignments with the firm and was often too ill to leave his house. He managed a few public appearances until the end of 1885. After spending the summer of 1886 in New London, Connecticut, he returned home where he became seriously ill, and on November 16, ordered nearly all of his papers, both personal and official, burned. The next morning, Arthur suffered a cerebral hemorrhage and never regained consciousness. He died the following day, on November 18, at the age of 57. On November 22, a private funeral was held at the Church of the Heavenly Rest in New York City, attended by President Cleveland and ex-President Hayes, among other notables. Arthur was buried with his family members and ancestors in the Albany Rural Cemetery in Menons, New York. He was laid beside his wife in a sarcophagus on a large corner of the plot. In 1889, a monument was placed on Arthur's burial plot by sculptor Ephraim Kaiser of New York, consisting of a giant bronze female angel figure placing a bronze palm leaf on a granite sarcophagus. Arthur's post-presidency was the second shortest of all presidents who lived past their presidencies, 
after that of James K. Polk who died just three months after leaving office. Legacy Several Grand Army of the Republic posts were named for Arthur, including Goff, Kansas 212 Lawrence, Nebraska Medford, Oregon, and Ogdensburg, Wisconsin. On April 5, 1882, Arthur was elected to the District of Columbia Commandery of the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States, Mollus, as a third-class companion, insignia number 02430, the honorary membership category for militia officers and civilians who made significant contributions to the war effort. Union College awarded Arthur the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws in 1883. In 1898, the Arthur Memorial statue of 15 foot, 4.6 m, bronze figure of Arthur standing on a bar granite pedestal was created by sculptor George Edwin Bissell and installed at Madison Square, in New York City. The statue was dedicated in 1899 and unveiled by Arthur's sister, Mary Arthur McElroy. At the dedication, Secretary of War Elihu Root described Arthur as, wise in statesmanship and firm and effective in administration, while acknowledging that Arthur was isolated in office and unloved by his own party. In 1938, 52 years after Arthur's death, the U.S. Post Office issued a definitive stamp in his honor. Arthur appeared on a U.S. $1 coin in 2012. Arthur's general unpopularity during his presidency carried over into his assessment by various historians, and his reputation after leaving office mostly disappeared. By 1935, historian George F. Howe said that Arthur had achieved an obscurity in strange contrast to his significant part in American history. By 1975, however, Thomas C. Reeves would write that Arthur's appointments, if unspectacular, were unusually sound, the corruption and scandal that dominated business and politics of the period did not tarnish his administration. As 2004 biographer Zachary Carabell wrote, although Arthur was physically stretched and emotionally strained, he strove to do what was right for the country. Indeed, Howe had earlier surmised, Arthur adopted a code for his own political behavior but subject to three restraints, he remained to everyone a man of his word, he kept scrupulously free from corrupt graft, he maintained a personal dignity, affable and genial though he might be. These restraints distinguished him sharply from the stereotype politician. Arthur's townhouse, the Chester A. Arthur home, was sold to William Randolph Hearst. Since 1944 it has been the location of Colustian Spice Emporium. Thank you for watching this video.